Hello and welcome to this review of my Zenith SWA4300. This is a really funky keyboard with magnetic valve switches, which are a really cool and exotic type of switch I'll come back to in a bit. I got this keyboard off eBay for a heavily reduced price, which took me some time to accomplish because the seller really didn't want to budge at first, but after letting him sit on it for a few months, he was much more pliable. It's brand new, completely unused, and it came in its original box, with the manual and everything included. Always nice to have little things like that. I've had this board for ages actually, but I wanted to wait until I'd done my ZKB2 review first, as there are a lot of things to compare between the two. Here is the model sticker of the keyboard. It says it's manufactured in 1989, presumably in the USA, and it got reworked in early 1992 and it lists a part number, serial number, and a manufacturer's part number, but no actual model number. This is pretty typical of Zenith, as they used a whole slew of different part numbers for the same boards, but they didn't always include the model number, so naming these old Zeniths isn't always easy. Which is why I'm glad to have the manual, because that does list it. It's SWA4300. As for the construction, the back panel is metal, as you would expect of a Zenith keyboard. And together with a metal mounting plate inside, that brings the total weight to a hefty 1.9 kilos, half a kilo heavier than a Dell Bigfoot. It also has these flip-out feet on the back. They're actually spring-loaded and pretty stiff, possibly from not having been used a lot yet. Furthermore, there are two Southco quarter-turn receptacles on the back to mount the keyboard, because that's what this keyboard was actually marketed as a rack-mountable industrial keyboard. It's surprisingly flat for a keyboard this old, and it has very narrow rims, which was quite uncommon at the time. Now, Zenith are most well known for the Z150 and ZKB2 keyboards, and this one actually looks vaguely like the ZKB2 in general appearance at first glance. But in reality, this keyboard almost couldn't be more different from its brothers. First of all, the Z150 and ZKB2 are not that uncommon. Thanks to several huge contracts Zenith secured in the United States, they pop up every now and then, although almost always in America. In stark contrast, this one appears to be super rare. There are a few traces on the internet of one of these on eBay India, but I haven't found any evidence at all of others. Second, the logo. Zenith usually branded their keyboards with their kick-ass Zenith Data Systems logo with that cool lightning Z on it, which is one of the best looking badges in the business. This one sports a Heath Zenith computer-based instruments badge instead, although it has to be said that this one looks at least as kick-ass. With the golden Heath and silver Zenith logos on black metal, this definitely scores very high on the awesomeometer. Wouldn't be a proper Zenith without it. Third, the layout is subtly different. Zenith was one of the very few companies that consistently used medium ass enter keys, like this, which is essentially a big ass enter key where the top portion has been made a little bit less wide so that you can get a bigger right bracket key. This wasn't encountered very often, possibly because it wasn't all that popular. This one has a normal full size big ass enter though. It also has a bank of lock lights at the top whereas the ZKB2 and Z150 will use these cute integrated LEDs instead. Fourth, the beeper. One of the most well-known features of old Zenith keyboards is that they included a little piezoelectric beeper, which makes a sound every time you press a key. This was done because they used linear switches, which by themselves don't provide a cue to let the typist know they've been activated, which makes them more or less clicky linear keyboards, a rare combination. But this keyboard doesn't have one, presumably because it doesn't use linear switches. And speaking of the switches, that's the fifth thing that's different. Zenith is most well known for using linear ALP switches, particularly green ones, for which Zeniths are by far the most common source. This keyboard doesn't have ALP switches, nor are they linear. In fact, they're not even electromechanical in origin. They use low-profile ITW magnetic valve switches instead, which is a major part of why I bought this keyboard, because I find the mechanism behind these switches fascinating. It's very complex, by far the most complicated of all the switch types I've reviewed so far. This is what the switch looks like with the keycap removed. There is no top part of the housing, just the slider sticking out, much like NMB high-tech switches. Now, what I hope you can see here 
is two wires threaded through a little bead-shaped piece of ferrite, which is a type of easily magnetizable composite ceramic with metal filings in it. So in other words, it more or less conducts magnetic fields, but not electricity. The two wires are separate, unconnected circuits, one of which is a drive wire and the other is a sense wire, and the whole setup is very similar to that of a transformer. Also, when viewed from the back, you can see that there is a little slab-shaped magnet embedded in the slider. This can move in front of the ferrite bead or away from it. Here is a scheme showing the switch construction in detail. Let me walk you through what the idea behind it is. Like I mentioned before, it has a drive wire and a sense wire on which it talks and on which it listens for a response, respectively. First, a pulsed current is applied to the drive wire to simulate an AC signal. Note that the drive wire has a loop shape. Current going around in a loop, even just a single one, creates a magnetic field around it, shown here by the red arrows. The ferrite core, which is easily magnetized, picks up the same magnetic field orientation. Then, the sense wire feels this magnetic field from the ferrite core, and through it, a secondary current is induced onto the sense line, and the controller picks up on that. However, when the magnet in the slider is in front of it, the induction is blocked because the magnet is much stronger than the tiny magnetic field induced by the primary current, so it completely overpowers it. This is effectively the analogy of opening and closing a switch on a normal keyboard, although ITW made versions of these switches that are by default closed and then opened when you press a key, as well as ones that work the other way around. To make this system work, ITW devised and patented a keyboard matrix and scanner system that detects each key press separately, in turn, with N-key rollover protection. This is quite complicated, but I'm going to do my best to explain it as simply as possible. Now let's first look at a normal keyboard matrix with normal switches like cherries to see how a system with limited rollover works. You have drive lines 1, 2 and 3, and sense lines A, B and C. So it sends signals on the columns, in turn, and then listens on the rows to see which keys are being pressed. Suppose you press keys A, S and X, which closes those circuits. Now the keyboard will first scan what keys are being pressed on the left column by putting current through line 1. Because switch A is closed, the current also works its way through to sense line B, and the detector sees line B light up when line 1 is powered, so coordinate B1, which is the A key. However, because switches S and X are also closed, the current can also make its way through switch S onto column 2, and then through the wrong drive line, C, which would make the computer think that C1 is also being pressed, which is key Z. But Z isn't pressed at all, so in order to make sure it's not seeing keys that are not being pressed, it ignores the third key's output, hence why you only get two key rollover. So far, not too hard, right? This is what a magnetic valve matrix looks like. The way this works is using multiplexers, which are like lines that can flip between different positions. This way, you can choose which lines are connected to a ground and which aren't. Note that current can't flow unless it can actually go somewhere. So if a line isn't connected to the ground, there can be no current in that line. There are several multiplexers in this design, one at the drive side, and one at the sense side. Now suppose we scan for key A, which, again, is being pressed together with keys S and X. What the controller does is it connects line 1 to the ground, so the current can flow through it, and it makes sure that line B is disconnected. Now when it powers line 1, current flows from top to bottom. And, as we've seen before, that induces a magnetic field in the ferrite on switch A and that causes electrons to move on the other side. But because line B is now disconnected, you get electrons piling up on that side, but they can't go anywhere. So there is a potential difference on line B, also called a voltage, but there is no flow, so there is no current. Keep in mind voltage and current are not the same. And because induction works with current, not with a voltage, you can't get induction through switches S and X like we could before but the voltage on line B is seen by the detector, which thinks, hey, I'm scanning for B1, which is button A, and I'm seeing a voltage, 
so it's being pressed. The controller actually stores this information and considers A as constantly pressed until it finds it not pressed anymore in another scan down the line. So because it remembers which keys are being pressed at any given time, and you can't get false signals, these switches have full N-key rollover. Note that apart from N-key rollover, these switches have another advantage, reliability. Although the manual sadly doesn't list a lifetime or other details about the switches, really, Cortron, who made these switches and who since replaced them with a similar but different design, claims a 100 million cycle lifetime for their current line of switches. So I'm pretty sure these ITW switches can hold up to at least that, if not significantly more. Kind of makes me wonder why Zenith didn't have more boards made by ITW, considering their love of durability. There is no spring in the switch though, presumably to save space inside the switch to keep it low profile. So instead they put a buckling rubber sleeve under the keycap to provide the return force, as well as the tactility. This does mean that if you take a keycap off, it will continually register a key press there. As for the key feel, it doesn't feel anything like other mechanical switches. It's a bit hard to describe in fact, but there is one thing it immediately reminded me of, and that's something you might not expect. You ready? Yes, Topra. Yes, these really feel like Topra. They're not far off at all, possibly because the magnetic valves use the rubber sleeves. It gives them a sort of rubber dome feeling, albeit an extremely high quality one. The big difference, of course, is that on Topra, there is a rubber mat underneath, while with the valves, you're just hitting the bottom of the switch instead. And that's why the bottoming out feel is different, as well as the sound. I'll give you a quick comparison. The Zenith is much louder than the HHKB here. You can quite clearly hear the slider hitting the bottom of the switch. Whereas with Topra, it's much softer and more silent. The rubber mat actually helps Topra a fair amount here because the ITWs bottom out pretty hard, almost painfully so, partly also because they're more tactile than the Topra switches, as well as heavier at around 60 grams of force. It took me a while to get used to it in fact, although it's okay now, my fingers got pretty achy when I used them at first. Overall they're very closely related to Topra though, they're not that different at all, just not as refined maybe. The keycaps are very thin PBT, but they do have excellent quality, razor sharp die sublimed lettering. It's very small and thin on the keys with actual words on, but it's not blurry in the slightest. They do have a unique shape, a little bit like a loaf of bread. This appears to be a dead giveaway for this type of switch as I haven't seen it on anything else yet. The top of the keycaps is the same size and shape as other keys, but presumably because the sides aren't very steep, I found myself making a lot of mistakes at first. It's easier to hit the wrong key. Still, they're pretty cool guys. I mean, just look at that lettering. Conclusion, this thing is really cool. The switches are pretty harsh on the fingers, but apart from that, the key feels okay. This little ridge at the top looks a little bizarre, but other than that, I think it's a pretty good looking keyboard as well, especially with that badge. And of course, it's new as well as old and rare, so it's a pretty cool guy overall. That's it for this review. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And here is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.